Okay, so Lung Cancer Foundation of America, I like to say, was founded by two survivors and a widow, Lori Monroe, David Sturgis, and myself, Kim Norris. And we originally met at a National Cancer Institute meeting called a SPORE meeting, which was, represents a special program of research excellence. Uh, Lori was a uh, lung cancer patient. She was stage four at diagnosis. David Sturgis was a stage one lung cancer patient. He had surgery and so hopefully that had taken care of it. And I was a lung cancer widow. The three of us just connected. And at that point, I really didn't know anything at all about lung cancer and the state of lung cancer. But I went to this meeting and there were all these breast cancer advocates and researchers and all these prostate cancer advocate and researchers. And then there was this small group of lung cancer researchers and this even smaller group of lung cancer advocates. And that's where, David, we met you. But back then, the state of lung cancer research, both financially and what was being discovered, was not very good. I mean, do you remember those times? Absolutely. Th those times, we really were just starting to understand some of the molecular biology of cancer and just starting some of the early targeted treatments. But we hadn't even thought about immunotherapies at that time in a serious way. Mm -hmm. But it was exciting, even with the minimal representation that lung cancer had. Lung cancer had a community of researchers, and I had my SPORE grants, and Steve Dubinat had, had a SPORE grant, and mm -hmm. just getting those people together, there was an energy that, that really encouraged me that the future would be better than the past. Well, and I think that's what captured me because when I went to that meeting, I had always heard that researchers and doctors were very isolated and competitive and didn't want to share information. But I remember sitting in the meeting with just the lung cancer researchers and someone would be up there talking about what they were doing and someone else in the audience would say, hey, David, send me your tissue and I'll put it through my XYZ machine. And I remember thinking, these guys aren't competitive. They're helping each other out and trying to work together. And that really stuck with me, that, that at that time, there may not been, have been very many, but you guys were all working together and trying to solve these mysteries. But more importantly, you were trying to do it on a shoestring of a budget. And my feeling was, you were trying to keep your labs open because the funding just wasn't yeah, it's there. Always a struggle. But the other aspect of these spore meetings was the integration from the beginning of the patients. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt that while lung cancer is a, an academic problem and trying to figure out the molecular biology and this and that, there's a reality to lung cancer as well and that these patients are impacted by it in a way that it's hard to understand until you work with, with them. You know, the possibility of a, of a treatment five years from now may be exciting, but a patient has an urgency mm -hmm. to find things right now. And getting them in the room to convey that urgency is, is transformative. And we, especially with Lori Monroe, mm -hmm. who was my patient, uh, she, she came into my office the first time with young children uh, and was told that she had six months to live. And she looks me in the eye and it almost felt like she burned holes in my retinas <laughs> with her eyes and told me that she, my job was to get her to live long enough to see her children graduate from high school. And you know, that kind of a, an urgency is only really conveyed by the combatants, by the, 
the patients themselves. And integrating patients uh, into the research process, I think, really helps doctors understand uh, this urgency. And fortunately, um, Lori was an integral part of the early years of LCFA. Mm -hmm. But we managed to get her girls through high school yeah. and graduate college and get, even get married and have a grandchild for mm -hmm. um, many, many years beyond the six months that she was given initially. And so these kinds of stories keep researchers going. It's, it's difficult for patients, but it's also difficult for clinicians taking care of lung cancer patients to see the, the kind of suffering that these patients go through. And also rejoice with them when there's a success or a remission or a treatment works. So um, I think really understanding the patient perspective is key. Yeah, so you talk about the w watching what the patients go through. I've often thought it's got to be hard as a lung cancer medical oncologist to see so many of your patients die, especially back then. And the difference between back then when there just weren't, let's face it, there weren't many survivors. And now there's still not enough, but at least the number is increasing. That's got to feel good to you. Well, it does. But you also understand that many of our treatments give people time, right. but aren't curative. And so these people will have good quality life for often years, but you always have to, to make sure they understand that this is not a curative treatment and it will eventually progress. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's heartbreaking to see people who do well for many years suddenly have a recurrence of their cancer. Um, and it also urges us to, to do better and come up with better treatments that we work on every day. Yeah. I remember when my husband was diagnosed in 1997. This is before anything targeted therapy, <clears throat> immunotherapy, nothing was available. And you know, he was stage four at that time, right off the bat. He was only 45 years old. But for the next two years, he did five different clinical trials during that time. And although they ultimately didn't work, um, it did buy him time. And I remember his brother asking him a few weeks before he passed away, would you do it again? Would you do the trials, the clinical trials again? And he said, yes, absolutely. He said, not only did it buy me time and quality time, but hopefully it would find, help find an answer for the people after him. Yeah, so there's things to understand about clinical trials that aren't obvious to patients. And first of all, clinical trials are not just randomly trying drug A and drug B. They, today, clinical trials are intelligently designed based on science and are successful way more often than they were in the past. So we like to say that clinical trials are tomorrow's treatments that you can get mm -hmm. today. Yeah. And so not only are they important because the therapy might work, but they also are important because they give hope to patients. Way too often, doctors will say to a patient when they first get diagnosed, your average survival is six months, end of story. And they, they just instantly take a hope away from a patient. Mm -hmm. But when I approach a patient, I, I tell them I can't tell how long they're going to live. There's, there's a bell curve to every, everything. All my patients do better than average, of course. And even if the treatment is suboptimal today, maybe we can get you through to the next drug mm -hmm. that gets developed or the next clinical trial. And it's tragic when a patient gives up hope. Uh, even w in a setting where we don't know of curative therapy, I mean, taking away their hope, I think, destroys their lives in many ways. Um, and clinical trials give people hope. Yeah. No, that is so true. And I remember back then, 
in the early 2000s um, when David Laurie and I would be talking to members of Congress or senators or whoever would listen to us about the lack of funding, um, we would try to talk about hope. But it was really hard because there really wasn't much back then. But there's a little. There was a little and just <laughs> enough to make it happen so that today it's easy. Not so easy. Well. Easier. Easier. But you're right. I started in a focus on lung cancer in, in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, most patients weren't even treated. They were just given morphine right. and you know, comfort care. Mm -hmm. And today, it's a completely different story where most people have effective therapy options and often effective options after those effective options start you know, stop working. So um, even a little bit of hope is important. Right. Well, when we started Lung Cancer Foundation of America too, we knew that the primary goal was going to be to fund lung cancer research. Um, and I remember you being our first chairman of our scientific advisory board, had some really sage advice for us when we came to you and the board the first time with money that we wanted to give away to a grant. And I remember you advising us that rather than giving a lot of smaller grants, $25,000, $50,000 grants, that you felt we would be better suited to give fewer grants but larger amounts in order to track the best and the brightest into the world of lung cancer. Um, and that's what we've done. We followed your advice and did that. Um, I feel, I'm very proud of the, what I call the portfolio of our young investigators that we have funded and what they have accomplished. From your perspective, I mean, you've been a part of our organization the whole time and very important to who we are today, but what do you feel the success of the program has been? Well, I'm, I'm often asked, what are the unmet needs in lung cancer research? And I usually respond by saying, let me list the met needs, mm -hmm. end of you know, period. That's it. Because there, basically, there are no met needs in lung cancer. You can use your money in, in different ways. Um, but I really think the best return on investment is recruiting into lung cancer research talented young investigator who's just starting out needs to get a grant to get that early preliminary data and what if they do they get that preliminary data and they can parlay that into applications for much larger more impactful funding but just as important that investigator has been set off on a path to study lung cancer mm -hmm. which has been so historically underfunded that many of the brightest investigators have been attracted to other, other areas. And so lung cancer lagged behind many other cancers in terms of uh, the attracting these investigators and science progress in, in new treatments. Mm -hmm. But I'm very pleased to say that through grants such as the ones LCFA has administered, uh, you've accrued into your cohort, some very talented people who are making significant progress uh, in the field. And, and as a field, I think lung cancer is almost the example of the success of science in treating cancer. That the, We are talking about treatments that prolong average lifespan, from, not from four months to five months, or you know, adding weeks to a person's life with the cost of toxicity. But some of these treatments take a what was a four-month survival, and now people are living eight and ten years mm -hmm. with excellent quality life taking a pill. Right. And you know, these kinds of things don't happen by chance. They happen through science and matching the right treatment to the right patient. 
And there are few other diseases where they have so many examples of exactly that. Right now, the NCCN recommends that you have, you do testing for, I think, nine different markers. And each one dictates a very specific therapy that's highly impactful. And um, that doesn't happen without research. And I think the LCFA junior investigator grants have really brought, has been a rallying call for the for the troops to, to study lung cancer and, mm. and do even better in the future. Yeah. It's funny, I, I often like to say that I've been doing this for over 20 years, lung cancer patient advocacy, and I feel like I've had a front row seat to some of the most amazing, rapid discoveries that have gone directly from the bench to the patient and led to people, as you've just said, not a matter of extending their lives by months, but by years. And good quality life. And good quality life. But you, you understand the importance of uh, quality of life, especially in lung cancer, because many patients aren't cured. And mm -hmm. if you prolong their life, but they have chronic, barely tolerable toxicities, that's not as much of a win as really optimizing the drugs to have low toxicity, optimizing their quality of life mm -hmm. so that they can live the best possible life for the amount that they have left. So I think we have, in, in my own group, I'm very proud of the people, the young people that we have developed, um, some of whom have been supported by LCFA and Junior mm -hmm. Investigator Grants. And right now, at the end of my career, I think my biggest success is trying to, uh, my biggest driver is to try to promote the careers of the young people to be the next generation of, of leaders in lung cancer research and clinical care. Yeah. Well, I think we're very lucky to have you. You're an integral part of who LCFA is today, so thank you. We well, are very welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.